We're starting this brand new sermon series today called Bricks or Sticks. And so uh, the, the title, I liked it because it rhymed, but it made me think of the three little pigs. You know what I'm talking about? So the three little pigs, first pig builds his house out of straw or hay. Second one builds his house out of third one what? Okay, there you go. Bricks or sticks. And so a uh, wolf comes, blows the straw down. What happens? Okay. Then the sticks, what happens? Okay. Then he comes to the bricks. He tries to blow the house down. And, and what happens to the wee little pig? He's safe. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to spend time. We're going to go into a book of the Bible that many of you probably have never read before. Uh, I haven't taught on this, this book for years, the Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. And what we're going to do for the next five or six weeks is we are going to go to the Word of God and, and, and evaluate, are we building our relationships, dating, um, marriages, going through problems in marriage, ups and downs? Are we building our relationships on bricks or on sticks? Because if you're building your relationship on sticks, life gets difficult, the big bad wolf comes, what happens when he blows? It all falls down, right? And I, I think, I'm, I'll be honest with you, we're good at certain things. I think a lot of what we're good at, if I'm honest, is, is sticks, like... Uh, um, the, average, the average wedding in America right now, I think we're expert wedding throwers. Anybody else? Like we are, I, I have been to some crazy good weddings over the past years of my life. Like crazy good. Like just um, every detail thought out. We are amazing wedding throwers. And so the average wedding in America right now, and here, so I, I have three boys. And one of the traditions when you have boys and girls is the girls' family has to pay for it. And I love that tradition. I'm never moving away from that. <laughs> Because the average, the average wedding in America right now costs between thirty-one and $38,000. If you're a man with a daughter, sell a kidney, do whatever you got to do, right? Start planning now. If they're six months old, save up now, right? And so, because most people are going to get married in our culture. It's just the way it goes. Most of us get married. Some of you feel like you've been single forever. Chill out. Eventually, you're going to get married. There's billions of people on the world. You'll get lucky at some point. And so, right? And so... So bricks or sticks, we spend $30,000. $30, Here's what they found, so interesting. Spending lots of money is not an indicator of a, of a healthy marriage. They, they have found, actually, that those who spend over $20,000 on their wedding are two times more likely to get divorced than those who spend under it. Engagement rings, right? It's a whole engagement ring thing. They have found, because that's a big deal. And I'm not, listen, I'm not giving your, your fiancé an excuse to go to Claire's and get you a ring. And so... But they have found that, that people who spend over $4,000 on engagement rings are two times more likely to get divorced. They ask married couples, why are you getting married? What do you think the number one reason why, why people, when they're, when, they, when they're getting married, what number one reason? Smoking hot. <laughs> right? Like it's just, they're smoking hot. They're fine, right? They're, they're a 10. I don't know how kids say it now. And so, I, 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 listen, some of you are like, that's shallow, is it? You got to spend the rest of your life looking at that person. I don't think it's shallow. That's smart. And so, <laughs> anybody else? Are we not allowed to say that in church? It's so shallow. That's fine. And so, call me shallow how. And so, like, that's, right? <laughs> and so, like, I, I get all that. Like, I get all that. But here's what they found. If that is the main reason you're getting married, your likelihood of divorce goes up almost double. Like, if you talk to somebody and they just strictly land on their hot, you're in trouble. So for the rest of this month, what I want to do is I want to evaluate how you're building your relationships, and I want to see if you're building them on, on, on a solid foundation, on, on, on Scripture, on what God's Word says. And believe it or not, God's Word has a lot to say about relationships, about sex. This is going to shock some of you. Uh, about marriage, about how to fight through difficult seasons of your marriage, about what you should look for when you're getting married. I'm going to, I'm going to spend the first two weeks talking specifically to the dating people, but do not tune me out if you're already married, right? Because if you're already married, chances are you have a kid. You need to begin to get your daughter or your son prepared mentally for what they should be looking for in marriage. Because if they marry a knucklehead, for the rest of your life, you're going to be impacted. And you are not, a, I know some dads are like, I just stay out of it. You're an idiot. You're going to allow somebody to come into your house and have to deal with them, right, for the rest of your life because you just want to stay out of it. We're not going to play neutral. We're not playing, uh, what, do they, what do they call it, zone defense, right? Prevent, what do they call it in football? Prevent defense. Prevent you from what? Stopping anybody, right? And so like this, you, you need to be involved. Some of you are, are divorced, right? And you're like, you, you, you've already been through it. And here's what I'm, I'm going to be like the, the pastor. A pastor had to do a, a funeral one time for a guy. He was a drunk. He was abusive. He was an awful father. And he was an awful husband. 
So he's the pastor. He has to say something in his funeral. Everybody leans in. They're like, I don't know what he's going to say about this guy's life. He looks at the widow, and he says this. He says, don't make the same mistake again. I don't know if you can say that and get another funeral gig, but that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the same thing. Like some of you on your second one, you're, you're, you, you, you're coming in. You're not damaged goods, right? You didn't know what you were looking for the first time, and so let's, let's up what we're looking for. And so these first two weeks, they're really important. I'm going to talk to you today about what you should be looking for if you're in, in the, on the market, you're dating somebody, and next week I'm going to talk to you about the seasons of it, and then, then we're going to begin to go through relationship. And here's what's so cool about this book. It's basically like an old couple. You remember when people used to take pictures and put them in photo books? Some of you are like, I've never seen that before, right? Ask your parent, right? And so they used to, they, they wouldn't go through their phones and slide through Facebook. They would open up a photo book and they would, older couples would just begin to talk. And this is essentially what this is. The book of Solomon, uh, or Song of Songs, has three, three characters in it. Um, Solomon, he talks. Um, the, 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 the woman, she's called the Shulamite woman, which we don't even ever know her name. But if you study the Hebrew and Shulamite, it just means Mrs. Solomon. This is the story of Mr. and Mrs. Solomon taking us through the relationship. And then the third group of people, and nothing has changed, is her friends. That's it. And what you'll notice about this book is the girl talks first and the girl talks most. (laughs) The guy is very calculated in what he says. You can learn something from that, guys. Think before you speak. We're going to talk about that. It's a really cool book. And uh, anybody, anybody uh, Cinderella fan here? Cinderella fan? Okay. Cinderella. Disney did not make up Cinderella, right? Cinderella, that story's been going across the world. What's the story of Cinderella, right? Uh, an unfortunate girl locked in her house with the evil stepmother somehow has a chance to meet the prince. They fall in love. Her pumpkin t- thing turns into a pumpkin again, right? The glass slipper fits her happy, everything's good from there, right? They, they go off in the, in, in the like this, this is not a new story. This is actually the story of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, you meet this girl, a Shulamite woman. Um, she's from the area of Ephraim. She's, she's a part of a family that has a farm. She has an evil, we don't know what happened to her parents, but her parents are gone and she has really mean older brothers. They make her work out in the field. And uh, so she's, she's not been able to take care of herself. And then one day she meets this shepherd. She falls in love with this shepherd. The shepherd tells her, I'm going to come back and marry you. But the, the stepbrothers don't believe it. Some time has passed. She's in love. They're developing this, this relationship. And then she gets summoned to, the, to, the, to see the king. And she walks in to see the king, not knowing who the king is. And the king is actually the shepherd. Movie. She gets married to a king and has a perfect, the perfect guy, but just because you have the perfect guy and the perfect girl doesn't mean you have the perfect marriage. Marriage is still work. Some of you are like, I don't know why my marriage is so much work. It's because there's another person involved in it. <laughs> like, it, let's just be honest. You put you on a, and, and you're there. Put you on a desert island, you would fight with yourself. Mar- marriage is work, and so it's going to take us through the ups and downs. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start in chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter to you. I want you to see the conversation, and then I'm going to talk to you specifically about what's going on. Now, you're probably not going to understand 85% of what I'm about to read, right? So just chill, try to take it through your mind, and then we'll break it down together. Can we do that? Okay, Song of Solomon chapter 1. I'm going to hook you right from the beginning. Watch what it says, Song of Solomon chapter 1. It says, Solomon's Song of Songs. This is, this is it. This is my best work, he says. Verse number 2, she talks, right? That's all he gets. <laughs> hey, you're done. Watch how it starts. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Hooked you. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women all love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. You tracking with me? She likes him. (laughs) Friends say, we rejoice and we delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. Her friends like him. She says this. She says, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I yet lovely. Daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar. Like the tent curtains of Solomon. Don't stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons, we find out about her upbringing. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. 
Tell me you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like the veiled women beside the flocks of your friends? You still tracking? You're not. Don't lie. And so... Friends say, if you do not know most beautiful women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the, the tents of the shepherds. He finally talks. He gets, he gets his, here's, how, here's how he starts. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. This is why guys don't talk a lot. <laughs> First thing he says is, you're like a horse to me, right? <laughs> it's like buying your wife a bowling ball for Mother's Day, right? And so... Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your necks with strings of jewels. We will make earrings of gold studded with silver. She says, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. Google that. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engadai. If you have a kid under 12, I hope you've checked him in the journey, kids. If not, I'm going to give him sex education from the Bible over the next few moments. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves, he says. She says, you're handsome, my beloved. Oh, how charming our bed is verdant or green. We're going to explain that in a second. He ends it with the beams of our house, our cedars, our rafters, our fur. So what the heck is going on? So what, what he's doing and she's doing is she, they're describing the relationship before they got married. And they're saying, okay, here's, you ever hear this, all of us have the term red flags? Here's red flags you should look for. Here's green flags you should look for. They're saying, here were the green flags. Here's how we, we knew that this marriage would be good. Here's things that we look for. Um, it's like a filter. The, if you ask me how my week was after Easter, I'll tell you exactly how my week was after, after Easter. On Tuesday, I want to make coffee in the morning before I read my Bible because I cannot read the Bible before I have coffee. And the filters in my house were gone. I lost it. <laughs> then I forgot to go to get filters in the, the next night. Woke up on Wednesday morning, repeated the exact same process. I had an awful week after Easter because I didn't have filters. Now I got them finally. I'm trying to tell you this is a filter. This is, this is how, like, how do you filter out what you should filter out, what you should look for, what you shouldn't look for? Well, God's word right here gives us five things if you're dating, right? If you're in, on the market. Some of you in a relationship right now, like you are, you are already $10,000 into wedding planning and you're convinced, I can't, I have to marry this person because I spent $10,000. Well, let me tell you something. I know $10,000 is a lot of money, but do you know what costs more than that? Divorce. Some of you need to step back and go, I made a bad investment, but I'm not going to keep going because there's nothing worse than being married to the wrong person. On the flip side, so I'm like, that's awful. There is nothing better than being married to the right person. There is, there is nothing better. And it's often in this stage when you're in love, and we're going to talk about this next week, the seasons, and you're, you're infatuated, and they're perfect, and their breath doesn't stink, and nothing they do gets on your nerves, that you're making allowances, and you're not filtering things out you should filter out, and it's later on that it costs you. So let me give you some green flags. Here's number one, and I'm going to talk specifically in certain points to, to certain genders, right? The two genders, male and female, okay? And so we're going to talk. Here we go. Number one, here's the first, here's the first, the first one. They have character. They have character. You're going to look for somebody that has character. If you were to ask me, what's the number one thing lacking in our, in our world, specifically male-related? You know what it is? No character. They don't have character. They don't have godly character. Here, here's what she says. Did you, did you notice what she says? I want to go back in verse by verse. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. She's in love with him. But watch what she says. Here's why I'm in love with you. I'm not in love with you because you're a stallion. I'm not in love with you because you're the king. I'm not in love with you because you have big muscles. I'm not in love with you because you make good workout videos at Planet Fitness. I I'm not in love with you because you look good in yoga pants. I don't even know why dudes are wearing yoga pants. I'm not in love with you. <laughs> Because you have a big truck and you, all the other girls like you. Like, that's all true about him, by the way. I don't care how hot you are, how buff you are, how toned you are, how successful you are. You don't even stand on the platform with Solomon. This dude has it going on. He can get any girl that he wants at any time. And she says, here's the reason that, that I like you. Here's the reason that I'm drawn to you. She says, pleasing is the fragrance of your perfume. 
Your name is like perfume poured out. So let me just, let me just unpack this for you. Okay, so one of the great um, inventions of our time is running water. Okay, get an amen? Because you can go up and get a bath at any point that you want. Some of you chose not to today, and you should have. Let's be honest. But any time you want, you can wash off your body, body odor, right? Like you can smell good. Well, in that culture, you couldn't. So they came up with, a, with another option, and the other option is on days you couldn't take baths, you would dou- douse yourself with perfume or cologne. So you either smelled B.O. coming, when you walked in it smelled worse, or, or she's saying, you know how I put perfumes on to cover up my body odor because it's hot and we're in the Middle East and we're sweating all the time and I dump this on and you can smell me before I come? She says, your character mimics that. Like before you ever get somewhere, it's your good name, it's your integrity, it's your character that arrives before you arrive. So let me just, let me just give you a couple, a couple character indicators. Can I do that? Character and things you should look for. Maybe these are common for some of you, but for some of you, I'm like, well, you know this is true, but you still allow it to happen. So here's the first one. If you're a guy um, and you want to be a godly guy, you want to be a godly man, first thing about character you need to have, you need to be honest and trustworthy. You need to be, let me just say it again. You need to be honest and trustworthy. If you're a girl and you're, you're, you're looking for somebody who's honest, and tr- let me just, can I make it practical? If you're dating a guy and he has one of those screen protectors on his phone where only he can see what he's looking at, somebody told me about those a few weeks ago, I'm like, what? <laughs> and that's a thing? Yeah, it's fine, it's for privacy, from who? If you're dating a guy and he has all sorts of passwords on his phone, you never know who he's talking to and you can't ever get on his phone, He's probably not honest and trustworthy. If you're dating a guy and he has multiple phones, you're like, it's fine. He's a businessman. He's probably a drug dealer. (laughs) He's not that important. Are they honest and trustworthy? Like when you get later on, you get married, right? Or you get engaged. Let me just, can I just break this down for you? There should be no passwords that you don't know. There should be no emails you don't have of each other. There should be no friends you talk to that you don't know about. Like, are they honest and trustworthy? Because I can tell you, when you have that in your relationship, it is a game changer. And when you don't have that in a relationship, it is awful. Are they honest and are they trustworthy? Here's a good one, and here's one I'm still working on, and Leah's probably not in here right now, so she probably, because she, she, when she hears it, she can be like, you shouldn't say that because you don't do that, right? And so, but I'm working on it, right? 20 years, quick to apologize. Any other guy in this place hate being wrong? Come on, own it. I, it, it, it hurts me to take a loss in any area of my life. <laughs> Anybody else? Like, even when I apologize, I'll apologize with strings attached. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like, that's not, that is not a good quality. I'm always right. I'm, all, I'm not, never wrong, right? And when I'm wrong, it's hard for me to, are, are they quick to apologize? Here's one. Are they dependable? If you're dating a guy, and let's just say, let's say this, if you're, if you're a teenage girl and your guy you're dating is past, I don't want to say every 16-year-old kid should drive because there's some that should not be on the road. But if you start dating a guy and you drive and you're 18 and he's 19 and he's never gotten his license because he's afraid or whatever's going on and he's not blind, he, he could be driving, and you have to go pick him up for dates, I, I mean, do I even need to keep going? They're 26 years old. You have a date. They're supposed to be there at 7 o'clock. They arrive at 7.45, like nothing, no big deal. Like they say they're going to show up. They say they're going to do this. Maybe you're dating somebody, and uh, you've gotten to the, the adult years of life when they're supposed to pay stuff and, like, pay bills and pay car payments and pay for phone, and their phone got shut off, so they're on their third phone. And, like, are, are they, this is what she's saying, you're dependable, you're honest, you're trustworthy. Can I just give you one more of the character I want to I teach my kids? Are they generous? You know I'm talking about? Like the guys who complain every time a girl has to go to Target or buy makeup. Or you, and you ain't complaining when they look pretty, by the way, but you're complaining about what they ha, 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 have to spend or get their hair. You have a wife, get their hair done. Oh, my gosh, right? And so, and like all this stuff is going on, and then you spend thousands of dollars on a boat or fishing or golfing or whatever it is. They'll say stuff like, it's my money. You're an idiot. That's not not godly character at all. 
In fact, if you, if you want to see if they pass any of those things, there's a few, 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 few really practical ways. Just watch how they drive in traffic, play a sport with them. Listen to how they talk to their mom when they don't think anybody's listening because they disrespect their mom, they're going to disrespect you. See how they treat those who serve them. You ever been out with somebody and they, they're very disrespectful to the waiter? And you're like, they're just super busy. They're on their phone the whole time. Like, you, you, your 13-year-old kid should already be taught to look up when a waiter comes, put their phone down, and say thank you. That looks like Jesus. Right? Like, can I, can I keep going? Uh, you see how they treat those who serve him? Notice what he's willing to spend his money on. Here's a good one. Look at his friends. You want to know if he has character? Look at his friends. Let me, let me just show you something else that was really interesting in point number one. Watch what the friends say. They say, we rejoice with you and we delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. What, what's happening right here? The friends are giving their agreement in the dating thing. Here, here's one of the biggest mistakes that, that people make. You have parents that birthed you. That means from the beginning of your life on this earth, they have been dumping money, time, and energy into you. They have stayed up late nights worrying about you. When you started driving, they worried about everybody else, right? Like they, they have been highly invested in you, and you start dating somebody, and they come to you, your parents, and they say, mm, I think you can do better. And you say this, you just don't see their potential like me. <laughs> you haven't seen what I've seen. Yeah, I know, but we've seen everything else. Let me just, can I talk to the girls for a second? Can I, make, can I mess with the girls for a second? And so, because I'll mess with the guys. If you're dating a girl and you bring them home to your, to your house, and the entire time they're home at your house, they never speak to your parents, they dishonor and disrespect the home you were growing up in, they're in a bad mood. I'm just telling you, that bad mood turns into a bad life. And you you, you got to be in this, you got to look for godly, that's what, look, look even the friends are like, dude, yeah, that's, that, that guy's a catch. Like, that guy's the real deal. That guy has character. Let me just give you a few more thoughts. Number, number, number two, um, here's a good one. They make you feel certain. Here, here's, here's another one for, for girls specifically. They make you feel certain. Now, some of you are like, what does certain mean? They make you feel safe and secure. That, that, they, they make you feel, so if you're, a, if you're a husband, we'll talk about this in a few weeks. I guarantee one of your wife's number one needs in her life is to feel what? Secure. Safe. One of the biggest fights in my house in 2024, or actually 23, was uh, in me not making my wife feel safe because the dude broke out of prison. Remember that guy? So what, what by the way, what a year it's been. <laughs> like we, got, we got dad, you're like, yeah, I know where to go, but up in 2024, and then we get an earthquake. <laughs> Anybody else feel that? I thought, my, I thought my, my heater downstairs was blowing up. I was like, what is going on? Then I find out it's a 4.8 on the Richter scale earthquake, and then the eclipse is coming on 4.8. <laughs> Some of you real into stuff, you better get your life right with Jesus today. <laughs> I did. Friday, I was kneeling in my living room, right? <laughs> Repenting of my sins. I'm ready. So I remember last year that guy broke out. I broke out. He was, he was all over the place. He was in Longwood Gardens. And I kept telling him, he's not going to come to Phoenixville. <laughs> my, my back door hadn't been locked for three years. It broke. I couldn't fix it. Ian broke it actually a couple years ago. And so don't let him touch your stuff. And so <laughs> broke the door right off the handle. And so it's a long story. And so never fix it because I'm cheap. And so we live in Kimberton. I'm like, no one's going to get us, right? And so then the dude breaks out. He ends up in Phoenixville. <laughs> and I was not making my wife feel what? Safe and secure. You're dating somebody. You should be looking for somebody that makes you feel, th this is what she's saying. What, what, watch what, what happens. She, she breaks it down. And what, she gets really vulnerable with this person. You can only get vulnerable with people that make you feel safe. You can only get vulnerable with people that make you feel secure. Which, by the way, if you are a married man and you're having intimacy problems with your wife, it could be that you don't make her feel safe and secure. Because vulnerability leads to intimacy. It's way deeper than just touch and the, and the motion and the act of, of sex. Can I talk about this? There, there, is, there is a safety and a secure that leads to vulnerability, that leads to intimacy. So watch what she's saying. They're dating. And she says, how right everyone is to adore you. And then she opens up her soul. She says, dark am I yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, 
like the tent curtains of Solomon, don't stare at me because I'm dark. So let, let me just break this down to you because that doesn't make sense in our culture because we all want to be tan. She's saying in our culture to not have the sun ruin your skin, prove that you were um, rich, prove that you were high class, pr prove that you were valuable. What she's saying is my brothers made me go out in the field and work in the hot sun for many years of my life. And so now my skin is ruined and I'm insecure about it. I struggle in, in my value. And so here's the thing about it. No matter who you date, if you live in this world, specifically for females but males as well, you're going you're gonna to begin to date somebody that has insecurities that you're going to have to work through. And vulnerability is a great tool for that. Like I don't care, I don't care who you are. I didn't know until I was 22 I had a big nose. I thought I was good, and then I went to Oklahoma, and I'll tell you his name in case he's listening. He's my friend. His name was Paul Franks, and he looked at me one day, and he said, why is your nose so big, and why do you talk out of it? And I was like, <laughs> I, was like I, I think I have a mouth. He was like, yeah, but everything sounds like, right? Like, right? <laughs> So everybody, don't matter who they are, how, like, everybody has insecurities. And so he makes her feel safe and, and, and secure. Guys, your role as you become a husband, so you're already working on this, is a pastor, a provider, and a protector. I am not, I, you come to this church, and I pastor this church, but I am not your wife's pastor. You are your wife's pastor. You are to pray for her. You are to cry with her. You, you, you are to hug her when she's having a bad day. You, you are to nurture her. You are allow, to allow her to be vulnerable. And so when you're dating somebody, you need to make sure that there's some, somebody that you feel safe and secure with. That's what she's saying. You make me feel safe and you make me feel secure. Let me just give you, let me give you just a few more. No, number three. Here's a good one. They live with convictions. They live, write this down somewhere. They live, so if the guys lack character, let me tell you what the girls lack. Can I tell you what the girls lack? Conviction. Too many girls I know, they are willing to sacrifice their relationship with God to have a relationship with a man. Period. In fact, one of the hardest things for me to watch is for me to watch a single girl begin to fall in love with Jesus and pursue him and serve and the Lord begins to work in their life and heal the parts that have been broken and then all of a sudden some random dude shows up with them and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is going to be good or not. I just started coming to church. He's missionary dating and she shouldn't be, right? And, so, and then they start coming to church and then months begin to fake happen and then she begins to stop coming as much and he begins to influence her. And I think to myself, man, if you would have just lived with conviction, if you would have just had a set of beliefs that said, listen, this is, this is what I believe. If you want to get to me, you got to come up to the level of my beliefs. It's like Beyonce, right? What did Beyonce say? What did she say? If you like it, then you better put a ring on it. If you like, right? You're like, what did she say? All right. He talked about, and so. In fact, in fact, if you ask me what the number one thing I loved about my wife was, now I, I think I, I thought she was pretty. I'm not gonna lie, I'm shallow. And so, but after I started dating her, I realized well, she's a very confident, secure woman that does not need me. That if I if I want to date her, then I need to be a certain type of person that is equipped and ready to be a spiritual leader to her. Because if not, she is perfectly content being alone. And let me just, if you're a single girl and you are not perfectly content to be alone. You are a recipe for disaster because oftentimes you will allow convictions to be swayed. And here's what she says. Did you notice what she says? Real, real quickly, she says, uh, I'm not going to be like the other veiled women that try to get to you. He, he, she's the king. He's the king. Every girl wants to be with him. His palace is gold. He has the best camels in the world, right? He, he, had, he had everything, best food. Every girl wants to be with him. So what are girls doing? Girls are throwing themselves at Solomon, right? They're, they're veiling their face. That's what prostitutes would do. They're shaking around their bodies. They're trying to get her attention. And here comes the Shulamite girl. And she's like, I'm not going to do all that to get you. If you want to date me, then you got to raise up to the conviction level I have. And so let me just give you a few convictions I think you should have. Number one, never sacrifice your relationship with God. Never sacrifice your relationship with God. Number two, never compromise God's standards. What is that? What is that? We're going to learn. 
Listen, God loves sex, but he loves marriage. God wants you to have lots of sex while you're married to one person. Every other act of sex outside of that leads to disaster, leads to pain. So I know you're dating somebody, and I know they have needs, and I know that they're this, this, and I know they got this, and I know they're not going to pay attention to you because guys don't do that in our culture, and you are going to be a girl that says, you know what? I'm going to set really high expectations because you often get what you expect. You attract what you are. If you, some of you are like, I don't know how to attract a good guy. Well, listen, listen. If you, if you don't want to attract dogs, don't put out dog food. <laughs> Next service is going to love that line. <laughs> You're offended. I don't know why they keep coming around. What does the Shulamite woman say? She says, I'm not going to veil my face for you. I'm not going to flash my body for you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not stooping down to that level of these other girls. I'm going to live by my convictions. I'm never, ever going to go against God's standards. I'm not going to play house with you. I'm going to live with my convictions. Let me just give you two more. Laura, you come play me out. Number, number four, we've got two, two more. This, these, are, these are quick ones. Here's, here's a really important one. They're considerate. This is both sexes. They're, they're, they're considerate. Watch, watch what she says. She, he says, he talks, he says, you're like, a, you're like a pharaoh's chariot horse, he says. See that? First time he talks, you're like a horse, he says. And here's what he's saying. He's, he's saying, uh, Pharaoh's horses, they were always white. They were um, perfect. Some people would consider them godlike. And he's not saying, like, I think you're perfect. What he's saying is, to me, to me, you're, you are like perfection. T to me, you mark all the boxes. T to me, you're worth the pursuit. But by the way, I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about this, but that, that's, that's, how, that's how stuff should go. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Find is a pursuit word. So let me just explain this to you, girls. You are not supposed to be the pursuer. You, you, can I say it again? You're not supposed to be sliding into somebody's DM. You're not supposed to be dropping to the level to get somebody's attention. You are supposed to be, let me just, as a young girl, you are supposed to be so fixated on your relationship with the Lord and, and so secure in your identity in Him that in order for a man to get to you, they got to go to God. Yeah. And He is to pursue you. He, he is to, to ask you out. He is to pick you up. He is to pay for the date. I don't care. That's old-fashioned. Okay. Because new fashion is broke. <laughs> he is to ask your dad if he can marry you. Sit with, if your dad's around. If your dad's not around, find your grandpa. If your grandpa's not around, go to your mom. Go to somebody and ask permission to take your hand in marriage. He, he is supposed to do those things. And here, he, this, this, this king, man, he has it all. He can have any, any girl he wants. And he's so kind. She, she's kind back. Do you see what she says? She says, uh, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. I don't know what that means, i got to be honest with you, but sounds good. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved to me is a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engadai. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are dove. He's, they're kind to each other. He's attentive. He's thoughtful. He's gentle. This, this, this is a beautiful relationship. And the last, the last thing, um, the last thing I see in this chapter here, here's a really important one. I think this is oh, an underrated value of somebody you should look for in marriage because I see way too many grumpy people in our world. They're cheerful. Like they're fun to be around. Like, isn't that something you should look for? Life is hard enough and being married with Debbie Downer, right? <laughs> right? Or butt hurt Billy or whatever it is, right? Couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> Way down here, right? And they're just, they're just cheerful. How many guys do you meet when they get older? They're just always in a bad mood. Always in a bad mood. Complain about everything. Girls, always emotional. Hormones, always out of whack. Right? Every day, man. I'm not saying you're not ever in a bad mood, right? But man, if you're dating somebody and it's already filled with drama and there's already anger and there's already, it's not fun and you're just kind of going with it, hoping it's going to get better. Let me tell you something. Marriage doesn't make things better. It makes things worse. 
it magnifies the imperfections in your relationship. So let me, they're, they're cheerful. That, that's, what she's, that's what she's saying. She's saying, uh, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. Our bed is verdant. But that means greed. And then he says, the beams of the house are cedars, our raptors are firs. So here's what he's saying. Like, we're going out. We're going out in the middle of the, of the, of the trees, and we're skipping around, and we're, we're writing our names in the trees, our, our initials, and we're on dates. And she says, we're not just hanging out at home by ourselves. Like, you're taking me out. We're having a good time together. Maybe you're not an outdoors person. Maybe you're a shopping person. We're going to KOP together. We're just hanging out. Why are you, you're like, we don't have a lot in common. <laughs> Why are you dating them? That's like me saying, I'm going to hire somebody at the church that I don't like. I spend more time with the people at our church working than I spend with my own wife and kids. So one of the number one things I look for is they have a good sense of humor. We can make fun of each other. We, we laugh so that we don't cry sometimes. And that we like to be around each other. That's what I, like, all the other stuff is okay. Okay, give me that other stuff. But I want to I wanna enjoy being around the person. The person that I date, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I like my wife. Anybody else? Like, I don't just like the way she looks. But I like to, like, go get breakfast with her. And I like to ride bikes with her. And I like to watch TV with her. And, and, and I like to go to movies with her. And I like to go on vacation with her. And, 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 and I like to drive in the car with her. And, and I like to talk to her. Like, just, I just want, like, so, I want to be around her. Is anybody else? That is a great gift in your, in your life. So I'm telling you right now, if you're dating and you don't like that person, pfft. here's the thing about it. Here's the thing about it. So sometimes... Our, our altar calls, are, they're very, very specific. It'll be like, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to the gospel. I think Jesus is here every week. He wants a relationship with you. The Bible says if you would repent and turn your life over to him, confess with your mouth, believe that you can have a relationship with him. So that, that'll be the first step. But then the other step, the action step, some of you, you need to reevaluate who you are as a single person. Some of you, let's just be honest, you need to break up with the person you're dating. Like, you, you just, it just is. Some of you engage. You need to call out that engagement. That, I, in fact, you're like, is that your goal? Yeah, I prayed for that. I prayed God would break up engagements that shouldn't, that shouldn't happen, marriages that shouldn't happen. I prayed that God would give girls confidence in this place to not lower their standard. I pray that God would do a work in, in, in some guys' lives where they would look themselves in the mirror and go, man, I'm not the person that I'm supposed to be, but the same power that Jesus used to conquer the grave lives in me, so I have no excuse. I, 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 I was made for, for more than this. And so I'm praying that very specifically this happens. Some of you, I'm praying a spirit of encouragement because some of you have been looking and you started dating and you've been following the Lord and you broke up and now you've been looking and now you're alone and you've been alone for a while. It's been like six weeks, six months, six years. I don't know what it is. And it feels like a long time and you're like, this is it. And I'm just telling you, the Lord can do quickly in your life what it would take years for you to do on your own. So if you would just align yourself with the truth of Scripture and say, okay, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. The Bible says, seek first God's kingdom and everything else everyone is searching for. And wouldn't you agree that a lot of people are searching for the one? Everything else everybody is searching for would be added to your life. But your job is to seek first God's kingdom kingdom so you're gonna you're not gonna focus on fixing yourself relationally you're gonna focus on giving more of yourself to your relationship with Jesus so it's very action-based stuff right some of you are like this wasn't for me today I'm, I'm married I'm married to the wrong person where, where were you six years ago right and so I'm gonna tell you hold steady that's my that's what my we used to have an old president at Southwestern his name was Dr. Gwines and he used to just say before before he would pray everybody want to leave go to lunch he would say hold steady just hold steady for a few more weeks. Let's, let's, let's let the Lord do a work in our lives. The Lord's going to do a work in your spouse's life. Let's let the Lord do a work before you jump and try to do it on your own. Amen? Would you stand to your feet all over our house? Would you bow your heads and would you close your eyes? I'm not sure where you're at. Um, I know that every message will not be for every person in every season of their life. I know that. But there, listen, there is going to be application and truth for you in every sermon. I promise you. So let me start here. Some of you. You need to ask the Lord. I need the courage um, and the strength. I'm dating somebody I should not be dating. It's not a dig on them. They're God's too. God has a purpose and plan for them. But your job, your job is not to be a missionary to them. That's the work of the Spirit. That is really bad motivation. When you look at somebody and you say, if you start coming to church, I'll keep dating you. That is bad motivation. I promise you, eventually that fades. If you're dating somebody and you got to drag them to church... You need to let them go. They're dead weight. 
That's period. The person you're dating, they should be just as in love with Jesus. The Bible says not to be unequally yoked. Some of you need to raise your standards. That's scary. I get it. You've wondered if, that, if there's anybody good out there. I've heard, I've heard girls say that. Is there any good man out there? So here's my, here's, my, here's my answer. Is the Lord still saving? Is the Lord still setting people free? Is the Lord still healing? Is the Lord still redeeming? Then there is guys out there, the Lord is doing that work in. They're going to be a, become a brand new creation. What was done to them is not going to depend who they are in who they are. God wants to work in them. God wants to restore them. God wants to heal them. So yes, those guys are out there. Some of you, it's living by conviction. Like this is leaning into your convictions. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. Here's what I allow. Here's what I'll, 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 where I'll go. Here's the standard that I live by. And when that person is not meeting that standard, and listen, your standard is not your standard. If you're following Jesus, your standard is the word of God. That's it. The Bible says it's a measuring stick. His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And so maybe you don't know what his word says and you need to do some digging this week. But as soon as you hear what his word says, you do not need the confirmation of somebody else. His word is always true. It's always true. And as you're here in this place, and I, I believe the spirit is just moving. Like, there's, like he's going to move you to move. That's what he's going to do. He's going to move you to move. Some of you in this place, let's just, let's just be honest. Some girls in this place, you need to cancel your Tinder, your Tinder account. Or whatever people are doing right now to hook up. So I'm not joking. So some of you in this place, you're, you're dating somebody and you're addicted to pornography and you need to get help right now. Because you, you're being lied to. You, you think when you get married that your, your addiction to sex and to lust will go away because you're married. And all you're doing is prolonging the inevitable. You're going to bring garbage into your marriage. And so some of you, you need to get help right now. You need to get accountability. You need to reach out. You need to join a men's group. You need to talk to somebody. You need to bring it to light. That's both male and female, by the way. But there's, move, there's movement that needs to happen in, ev in every facet of, of this church. There's movement that needs to happen. You're building your life on sticks. And when life gets difficult, it's going to fall apart. So instead, I'm going to build my life on, on truth. And so some of you, you're, you're here and you're like, what's truth? That's Jesus. The Bible says he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except through him. We are not a religious church. We are a church that is built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here, here's the gospel. Everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and hell. So that means when you, when you take your last breath on this earth, you deserve hell. You deserve to be separated from God. You're created with the soul. You're going to live forever. And because of your sin, because of your rebellion, the Bible is clear that God could have wiped his hands of you. But it says while you were a sinner that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross for your sins. If you were here last week, we celebrated that. If you're here today, we're going to celebrate that again. The Bible says if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and what Jesus did, what did he do? He died on the cross. He was placed in the, in the ground in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose in power. And it's through him that you can be, become a brand new person. You have your sins forgiven. You become a new creation. If you would confess and believe, you call on the name of the Lord. I don't care who you are. Here's what it takes, though. It takes some humility, and that's hard. You don't got it all together. You don't have all the answers. When I talk about being a good guy, you're honest. You're not one. When I'm talking about being a secure girl, you're honest. You're not one. But you don't want to live that way anymore. Listen, the power to change does not come from you. The power to change comes from heaven. It comes from Jesus. So here's my challenge. If that's you, and you're standing here in humility, you realize you're a sinner, and you need a Savior, call on Jesus, and he'll answer. So I'm going to give you that chance. I don't know Jesus Christ here in Montgomeryville, but I want to. I don't know him as my Lord and my Savior. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm not going to make you come forward. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I want you to remember this day. I want you to remember April, April 7th, 2024. That's the day that I turned my life to Jesus. That's the day that I called on him, and I believe he answered. I want to pray with you as we close. Come on, if that's you all over this place. I'm not the person that I want to be. I need help. I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior all over this house. Would you shoot your hand straight towards heaven and say, hey, pastor, that's me. I see a hand. I see a hand. I see a hand. I see a hand. Anybody else? 
here in Montgomeryville, that's me. I need Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior. I see another hand. All over our houses, maybe online, would you pray something like this? Say, Jesus Christ, today I'm done running. I give you my life. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. And thank you, Jesus, that you rose in power. And because of that victory, I can be a new person. I'm going to be the man or the woman that you called and created me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, all over this house. Would you shout amen? amen. Let's clap together. Thank you so much for spending this experience with us. We'd love for you to join us in person next Sunday at our Phoenixville or Montgomeryville locations. To get information on how to join us, what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus, or if you have any questions, visit our website at jrny.church or follow us on social media. We can't wait to see you soon.